Um, so Joanna Drucker is the inaugural Breslau Professor of Bibliographical Studies in the Department of Information Studies at UCLA. Uh, she's internationally known for, amongst others, her work on graphic design, artist books, typography, digital humanities or speculative computing, digital aesthetics and visual knowledge representation. Drucker is a scholar, a writer, a book artist, a visual and cultural theorist and critic and a poet. <coughs> Her most recent scholarly works include the collaboratively written, openly available Digital Humanities with Jeffrey Schnapp and Todd Pressner from 2012, um, and SpecLab, Digital Aesthetics and Speculative Computing from 2009, and Graphic Design History, A Critical Guide, 2008. And Joanna's paper is entitled Diagrammatic Form and Performative Materiality. Joanna, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Okay, super. Um, well, thanks very much, uh, Janneke, for inviting me to participate in this peculiar um, remote way, but um, I'm sorry not to, to be present for the discussion, but um, this, is, this is great. Um, I, for some time, I've been really um, concerned and interested in questions about the identity and operation of aesthetic artifacts, um, as well as uh, what I would call instruments of knowledge production. And I'm interested in ways in which these are shaped and constrained uh, by critical constructs. And these constructs, in turn, um, have their own historical and cultural specificity. And so I'm interested in thinking about how we might rethink certain aspects of aesthetics, humanities, and modernity by looking, again, um, at certain formulations. So in particular, today, what I'd like to, to kind of bring into focus in the next few minutes is um, uh, the question of how the concept of the diagram um, might be usefully put into play in order to demonstrate principles of what I call performative materiality. And um, I'll take as a point of focus uh, the idea that an alternative poetics could have been articulated within 20th century modernism um, that would have taken the, the concept of the diagram rather than that of the image or ideogram as its paradigm. And had it done so, that these concepts of the diagrammatic and performative might have bequeathed to us um, a more dynamic and generative approach to electronic and digital um, documents as we encounter them. So I'm going to talk about this um, both from a kind of critical perspective and also um, from within my own work of creative and compositional practices, because I think there's um, dimensions of both. So um, uh, next slide, please. Let's start by asking the question, what is a diagram, and give it a bit of definition. And what you're seeing here is a kind of classic square of opposition from within um, logic. And uh, a diagram is distinct from an image because it has generative possibilities. So this diagram is actually extremely powerful. The four squares and the, and the oppositional structure are not an image of an argument. They are the foundation for an argument. So you can continually revisit the relationships among the different components of this square um, in order to, it's a syllogism, in order to think through, you know, the, um, the terms of exclusion, inclusion, um, and the logic therein. So it's different then from, say, what's in the next slide, which is an image. Now, this is a, um, a, an early information visualization by Eugène Marais, and it looks at the length of, king, uh, of the reigns of kings of England. Um, and, you know, the contrast here is one that touches on issues of representation and sort of the critical theory of representation. The Marais diagram stands in a one-to-one -one relationship or presumes to with that which it represents. There is one set of data, quote unquote, um, that is um, that, that corresponds to this image, where by contrast, the squares of opposition are generative. They're principles, they're structures. Um, so one is a generative structure and the other is a pictorial or representational structure. Um, next. 
So again, I put up another of these squares of opposition. Um, these are, you know, very uh, favored in the me in the medieval period when classical logic and um, you know holds sway. But again, they give rise to a whole set of diagrammatic principles that we'll now visit um, in relationship to other artifacts. The dynamic um, and generative quality of the square of opposition again is is what I'm trying to demonstrate here by contrast to the pictorial representations um, of information visualizations. Next. Um, so I want to suggest, and this is a, a sketch from some time ago, um, that is a sketch of reading practices, what we call the double parallax, the, um, the ways in which the, the gaze of the reader constitutes a text, and the text in return um, sort of you know, gazes back at the reader, and, not, and they never will meet. In other words, the, the provocation of the text and the interpretation of the reader are always going to miss each other. Um, even though there's a kind of field that constitutes the text in the in between. So this is a diagrammatic image of that process. Um, and it also, again, touches on the uh, what I call the um, sort of reception aspect of uh, my argument. If, if a diagram is a production tool for knowledge production, then um, the performative is the term under which the reception practice of constituting a text um, might be identified. So again, if you take as a premise of kind of post-structuralist tenet that reception is production, then we know that that act of production is a performative one, not a mechanistic or literal one. And this sketch was meant to indicate some of that. It's really complicated in terms of the argument, but there it is. Okay, next. So, um, as I said, I'm interested in the identity and operation of aesthetic artifacts, and one of the most familiar of these is, of course, the Codex book. And the scholarly codex book has a very complex paratextual apparatus, which I would suggest is diagrammatic in its operation. By diagrammatic, what I mean is that the um, uh, spatialization, the, the graphical organization here, produces semantic value. It produces meaning. Um, there's a kind of set of bibliographical codes um, according to which we read each piece of text because of its location as well as its relationship to the other pieces of text. So the graphical structure articulate, articulates semantic values in a diagrammatic way. It's not a picture of something. It's a set of semantic relations put into play by graphical structure and organization. Um, there's a particularly interesting text uh, to use for this, a picture of poesis. Um, and again, it's a, a famous text about the relationship between um, image and text relations in the Renaissance. Next. So again, going back to the diagram, um, sort of moving from the book back to an image of diagrams, um, diagrams um, function according to what I would call a logic of relations. So it, particularly in the West, we have a, a very elaborate um, language for entities. We have a great descriptive language for talking about what we think of as things, but we don't have a very good critical language or even descriptive language for thinking about relations. And diagrams are all about the relational properties of semantic fields. Again, they provoke the performative reading. So, um, of course, one of the areas where we do have um, a language of relations, and because there's a lot at stake, is what you see in the image on the right, where we have the kind of um, genealogical charts. Um, you know, who, who gets to inherit, um, you know, is, it's something that depends upon relations and kinship. So therefore, these are things that um, where we do have some language. Um, but again, the, the diagram um, need not be, um, you know, an image of something that is literal um, in the relations. It can be conceptual, as with the sephirotic tree that you see on the left, again, meant for contemplation and meant to generate, um, you know, sort of uh, the experience of faith, in fact, um, in its contemplation. So again, diagrams are generative rather than pictorial for the most part, though they can be put at the service, as we see on the right-hand side of the screen, um, they can be put at the service of a representational task as well. Next. So I go back to this idea of the book as a generative space, as a diagrammatic space. 
Um, and again, to suggest that the diagrammatic nature of the artifact, in other words, the structure of that thing that is produced, um, is what provokes the performative reading. And you see the performative is sketched here in the idea of a field of production, the book text, which is, you know, having various selections made from it and the kind of associations that lead out from a text into the wider field of bibliographical, um, you know, production in general. Next. So I've been interested for a long time in the way in which diagrammatic structures um, can be used as compositional structures. And this is a book that I created in 1977. It's a letterpress book, um, again, very complicated book, but it's a kind of meta book. It's a book about bookness um, as well as being, uh, it's a letterpress book in which I used uh, 48 drawers of type. I used every letter and every drawer once and only once to make a book that made sense about the social relations of a whole group of poets I had gotten to know. There's also a meta commentary on poetry and poetics and so forth. So it's a really complicated text, but it's highly structured so that, again, every zone on the page um, is coded with a particular semantic value. Next. Um, other works of mine that use these kinds of diagrammatic principles, well, almost all of my books, all my letterpress books do, include something like this, which was the history of the My Word World, where, again, the um, relationship of one text to another is uh, dynamic um, within the printed space of the page. You have that thin red line that interrupts the large black type. It's, a, it's an interior voice breaking through a kind of uh, public voice. Um, and so forth, and lots of intertextual play within the field of the page as well. Next. So my interest in compositional practices with regard to poetics and, and book space, um, again, have took me into uh, you know, the study of critical approaches to literature and literary works. And that's where I come to this other part of my um, assertion here, which is that there are ways in which the history of modernism and modern poetics might be rethought according to a diagrammatic uh, paradigm. Take a look at poetry here, go inside, next. Um, next, uh, thank you. Um, you'll see this very famous, um, you know, uh, work by Ezra Pound. And on the right, you see the way that it appeared in the poet pages of Poetry Magazine. And on the left, you see the way it's presented within a, a, a digital um, online scrap, right? Look at the difference between the two things. And of course, Pound is the great theorist of the ideogram and of the image and the notion of the image as a highly representational, autonomous and you know, um, uh, resolved kind of uh, approach to composition. And yet when we look at the image on the right, we see that the structure of that poetic work has been articulated in a way that allows each element within it to talk to the other elements. And it's much more like that syllogism than it is like poetic verse. Next. Now, of course, the great um, source that we would go to for looking at diagrams, if we we're going to rewrite an alternative history of modern poetics um, under that rubric, would be Stefan Mallarmé. Here's the 1897 edition in uh, Cosmopolitan with its kind of collapse of of pages. It's not Mallarmé's original uh, vision of the book, which doesn't appear until 1914. But we see, again, this diagrammatic structure, dramatic. I mean, Mallarmé is the person who comes up with the diagrammatic form for poetic activity. Um, next. And in the um, critical analysis performed by Marcel Brudthers in this particular version of Ancou Today, we see how that diagrammatic structure, um, which can here be viewed through the um, translucency of these vellum pages, um, really works as a kind of mobile, mo mobile in space around that central spine. So it's highly dyna dynamic and generative. And each of these components, again, works articulately in relation to the other. Next. So again, um, to sort of bring this uh, back um, at the end here um, to some of my own um, uh, projects, um, uh, the, the little book Diagrammatic Writing, which I just um, published this last year, 
um, is an attempt to pull together some of the work I've been doing in the history of knowledge production and, and diagrams, um, but put it um, directly into application in the study of the codex as a field of diagrammatic production. So again, it's a meta book, as you'll see in a moment when we go inside, um, that is almost entirely self-referential. It's meant to be a book about the workings of the book and the operations of its spaces. Um, Along the, um, somewhat differently, but across the, the, uh, the last few years, I've also been working on a project that I call Stochastic Poetics. It's what you see on the right-hand side of the screen. It's a letterpress book that was finished in 2012. And that book, again, goes back to one of my primary questions that sort of weaves throughout here, which is how do we understand the identity of aesthetic texts within the larger field of textual production? Um, and do we distinguish different orders of um, objects by their structure and form? Um, is that what makes an aesthetic text an aesthetic text? Um, you know, all of us since Marcel Duchamp are charged with the task of understanding some way to talk about aesthetics that isn't only um, a set of institutional practices or cultural practices such as naming and signing and framing. Um, so the stochastic project is really about the emergence of the poetic text um, in the noise culture of contemporary uh, language. But let's take a look for a moment at diagrammatic writing, and then I'll sort of pull things to an end and take questions next. So this is the first page of diagrammatic writing. Um, I'm not going to, it's actually the second page. The first page is simply the first line there. Um, and I'm not going to uh, go into detail um, trying to read this. Um, it's a little inexpensive and easily available book, um, but you see the self-referential quality of it. Next. Um, this was a study um, for diagrammatic writing and has the advantage of being much, much larger on the screen. So you begin to see how self-referential this is. Um, a a, you know, a text begins to suggest something. Look here, for instance, at the way this begins to have a life of its own within and around. In other words, it's always talking about its own moves and talking about how the structuring principles are making a textual semantic space. Next. Stochastic Poetics, by contrast, is, is a study of um, an event and an event space. Again, it's a kind of another principle of the performative is that we move away from the notion of the entity or the autonomous and self-evident and self-defined object into the realm of the event space as the kind of core principle of aesthetic practice and identity. And Stochastic is a study of, a, of again, a whole an event, a poetry event that I went to that raised this question about where does the poetic form, um, you know, come to gain purchase on our on our perception within the large field of noise and media culture that we inhabit. Next. So you see this um, kind of, you know, field of, of, of activity, of language activity, um, and within it, these kinds of assertions that are drawn from um, texts on stochastic processes, um, as well as uh, fragments and pieces of, of poetic composition coming into and out of being. Um, stochastic processes are, are non-deterministic. Um, they are very sensitive to start conditions. Um, they are, you know, once you begin, once a stochastic process begins, it has to unfold in order for you to see what its outcome is. It can't be predicted um, according to a set of linear um, or mechanistic rules. So it's a nonlinear, non-deterministic system. And, um, you know, so again, there, it's not, I'm not trying to make a one-to-one -one relationship between the diagrammatic and the stochastic. Um, stochastic is a compositional principle, um, but so is diagrammatic. And what they share is this kind of instability um, of the field of production that then loops into the um, instability or ge and generative um, conditions of reception. Um, and again, by using this kind of, um, you know, spatialized, generative, dynamic field of play. Uh, next. Um, and that's just another uh, final, uh, toward the end of stochastic poetics, where you see this active dynamic field of, of charged language from which these uh, scraps and fragments are coming into focus. Next. I just want to mention as uh, the, in the last 
seconds here um, the ways in which other forms of relational um, uh, compositional practices I think have a have a connection to what I'm articulating here. This is actually the um, uh, structure of the relational database I've worked on uh, off and on for the last couple of years that underpins um, a, a database memoir I've been working on. Um, and again, to think about the language of relations, how relations, ex when you make explicit the relations of components within a poetic work, um, you're in a sense showing how the armature of that work is structured in relationship to its surface. So I don't put the diagrammatic and relational in contrast to narrative or poetics, but rather see them as aspects of the same process, but distributed across time. Uh, last, and next, yeah, and I'll just leave this up um, for a moment. Harriet Bart's lovely poem, um, this is from a, um, a an anthology that was uh, an online anthology or collection that was put together by Jessica Smith of women and, and visual poetics. And I just think it's a lovely image um, of the scattering of the sort of language um, coming out of this woman's hand. Um, again, it's a kind of compositional deconstruction. So um, to pull it together then, um, in conclusion, I just want to say that um, I'm really trying to uh, put forth uh, for your consideration a concept of the diagrammatic as a generative form and format whose specific structures um, and features spatialize meaning um, and allow the semantic value of the graphical organization to be an aspect of the way in which meaning is produced in a kind of performative engagement with that form. We could argue, you know, um, you know, sort of that almost that performative readings do not depend upon the diagrammatic form of the artifact that they encounter. Um, the performative dimension of reading exists in in every encounter between a reader and a text, but the diagrammatic aspects of composition, um, I think. Um, play a role in expanding our understanding of the possibilities um, of poetic form, and in particular, I think, the kinds of changing conditions of uh, the identity of documents and texts, conditional texts, as we encounter them in the networked environment um, of, of digital production. And I'll stop there.